2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 9 in the King James text today reads in this fashion. The second, this second epistle, beloved, and I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they are they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water whereby the world that was then was being overflowed with water perished but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, as a thousand years that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I'm going to talk to us for a while this afternoon on the topic the neglected essential truth of repentance. If you bow your heads with me one more moment, Father, right now, God, the word of the Lord has been broken open as a loaf of bread is broken, that it might be shared with more than simply the one who handles it. Lord, you have placed in my hands the sacred responsibility of delivering the word of God to the people of God and the word of God is bread it is life it is sustenance to the people of God those who love you those today Lord who indeed await and look for your appearing master right now in the name of Jesus I ask God that the anointing of the Holy Ghost, that sacred, powerful anointing, would come down from heaven and would rest upon my mere human shoulders. Lord, that it would seep down into my mind, that it would reach my throat, my tongue, my mouth, and allow me, O oh God, to deliver the word that you have given me for the people of God at this time. No one needs to hear from me right now. We need to hear from the Lord. And Master, I believe you've delivered this word to me to deliver to your people. But I cannot do it alone. I need that anointing. Anoint as well. Touch the ear of every hearer. Those who would hear this message even now live. Those who who will hear it by reason of the internet at a later date and time. Lord, allow them to have ears to listen. Allow them to have hearts to receive. Allow their spirit to the O oh God to benefit by that word which I'm about to deliver. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' precious, sacred, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I've told you in the past, I come from old-fashioned Pentecostal 
stuck. I come from very old-fashioned Pentecostal background. We old-time Pentecostal preachers do not simply sit down and put together pretty words on a page that we can then speak to the church of the living God. But rather, we pray, we seek the face of God, we meditate daily. We ask God for a word from heaven that we might share with the people of God. And the Lord inspires these words in us to share with those who would listen. Now let me tell you, God knows who will be in the audience. God knows who will be hearing each message. And it is amazing how many times I've had people come to me and say, Do you know that you literally spoke about things today that I had just days ago been asking the Lord about and praying about because I did not understand them. And then as if God himself were answering my question, you wound up sharing exactly what I was needing to hear and understand. Folks, that's because God is real. If you think God is not real today, uh, I'm telling you from experience, say man, God is real. I was driving to Oklahoma where we have some property, many, most of you know, Tommy and I have property up in Oklahoma in the mountains. And I was driving up there this weekend on Friday. I went up to check on everything and make sure everything's good up there. And uh, takes a few hours or better, three or four hours to get up there. And as I was driving, I was praying and meditating and the Spirit of God began to speak to me on this topic. And we had such a rapport and such a conversation going on in my spirit that I knew this was the topic that I was to preach today. And you say, well... That's good, but I thought I had my message already lined up. I already had notes written. I already had an entire message prepared for today. But then when the Lord and I were talking about this in the car, I knew that he wanted me to preach on this subject rather than that subject. So I placed that message aside and instead I put together some notes for the message that I'm sharing with you today. Variations of the word repent appear 45 times in the Old Testament. In the King James Version of the Old Testament. And 60 times you will find variations of the word repent in the New Testament King James Version. The message and ministry of John the Baptist was said to have been a message and a ministry of repentance. The apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ taught us that to access the kingdom of God for our soul's salvation, we must first repent. Repentance is essential to salvation. It is not optional. And yet this is a subject that in many churches today, and I hate to say it, but especially LGBT affirming churches, you will not so much as hear this word spoken. It's as though it is anathema. It's as though it is a word that somehow offends them or troubles them. But I'm here to tell you today, as a messenger of God, as a preacher of the gospel, there is no access to the kingdom of God without repentance. When a certain Donald J. Trump was asked before the 2016 election if he had ever gone to God and asked for forgiveness 
for anything at any time. Mr. Trump responded by saying, I don't uh, believe it's necessary to go to God and ask Him for forgiveness. I don't believe it's needful that I do that. I try to do the right thing, and if I don't do the right thing, you know, and believe me, I'm talking a lot more intelligently than he did, but you know, he basically was saying, if I don't do the right thing, I try to correct my course and you know, go the right way, but I don't think I've ever done anything that I needed to go to God and ask for forgiveness concerning. And there are millions of idiots. I'm going to say it. Y'all know me. Y'all know me. If you know me at all, you know this preacher don't mince words. Because I'm going to take mincing words. It's just a waste of God's time. It's a waste of your time. I might as well just call it the way I see it. Yep. There are millions of jackass idiots in this country today who will tell you that Donald J. Trump is a Christian. And that Donald J. Trump, one lady actually I read something online this week. One lady who calls herself an expert in the Bible is reported online as having said that no one will get into heaven except that Donald J. Trump read their name out of the book of life. Folks, this is insanity at its highest level. It is beyond stupid it is beyond insane. This is a cult. This is, uh, it is absurdity. It is so completely contrary to the Word of God and to everything that the Word of God teaches that it's not even funny. A man who claims he has never once repented. Never once! Mm-hmm is going to read your name out of the book of life. Mm. And if he chooses not to read it, we're told by this lunatic, crazy woman, that you're not getting into heaven. Folks, this is trash. It is garbage. Yes. There is no access to the kingdom of God without repentance. You cannot ask for forgiveness without repenting. Repenting is... Uh, <coughs> Narrowed to the action of requesting forgiveness and asking for forgiveness is married to repenting. In Acts 2.38, the apostle Peter declared, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This was the very first sermon ever preached in the Christian church. Theologians of every stripe, be they Catholic, be they Episcopalian, be they Presbyterian or Baptist or Pentecostal or Methodist, every Christian theologian who understands anything at all about Christian theology will tell you that the church of Jesus Christ was born on the day of Pentecost. Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. The Lord had brought all the ingredients together to create the church, but he said to his disciples, Terry, wait! in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. He told his disciples, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. But they were not to go anywhere. They were not to do anything. They were not to preach a single sermon on behalf of the risen and ascended Christ until Pentecost came. When Pentecost came, that was God breathing life into the church. And it was on the day of Pentecost that the very first sermon ever preached in the context of the church was preached. 
It is recorded in Acts 2. It was preached by the Apostle Peter who was responding to the incredulous reaction of people in the city of Jerusalem. They heard a great noise. They heard a lot of things going on as the 120 who had gathered and waited, as Jesus said, in the upper room, they waited there for 10 days until the Holy Ghost came. Never did they start preaching prior to that 10 days because the Holy Ghost had not yet come. How did they know when the Holy Ghost finally came? Well, it was rather evident because the Word of God said, and when the day of Pentecost, which was the holiday they already celebrated, Pentecost was a Jewish holiday, a celebration of the first fruits. When the day of Pentecost was first come, Suddenly there came from heaven the sound of a mighty wind. Amen. There came from heaven the sound of a mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. All of a sudden this sound of a rushing mighty wind filled the room where these 120 people were. And the word of God said, And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. Each of them had this flame, as it appeared to them, a flame that was split in two. The flame went one way to the left, one way to the right. And it sat upon everyone in that room. And the Word of God said, And they all began to speak with other tongues, meaning simply they began to speak in unknown languages, languages they had never learned, languages they did not know. They all began to speak with other tongues, listen, as the Spirit gave them utterance, meaning the Spirit enabled them to do this, the Holy Ghost enabled them to do this. When this transpired, They made a lot of ruckus. They made a lot of noise. Something happened. The Word of God said that all of a sudden they began to bust out of that room and they began to make their way into the streets. And apparently, according to what we hear from eyewitnesses, they must have been talking about the goodness of God. They must have been glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ in a variety of unknown languages, languages they did not know. And how do we know this? Well, I'll tell you how. Because... The Word of God tells us that onlookers began to look at them and say, Wait a minute, aren't all these people Galileans? Aren't these, we know where these people come from. Look at them. You know, you can look at somebody from a certain neighborhood or a certain city or a certain community and you know they're from that area. You know, said, aren't these people, these, these, but how is it that I hear them speaking the goodness of God in my own language? How, how is this happening? I don't understand this. Because I got news for you. The community that these people were known to come from was not the most educated. The community these people were known to come from was not one that had a bunch of people who spoke multiple languages. That wasn't the kind. These were a bunch of poor folk. These were a bunch of working class folk. They, these weren't so highly educated. These weren't people who ought to be running around knowing two or three different languages. All of a sudden, I'm hearing them preach and speak of the goodness of God in my own language. And because of the holiday of Pentecost, Jewish believers from around the world had come to Jerusalem to celebrate that holiday. So there were people there from all over the world and they're saying, wait a minute, how, how, are these, how do these people know my language? How do these people know my, how do they know the tongue that I speak when I'm home? Do you hear what I'm telling you? That is how the church first knew that the believers had received the Holy Ghost. I got news for you. That is how the church today still knows that believers have received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Because when a believer receives the gift of the Holy Ghost to this day, 
You think God ain't real? <laughs> to this day, they will speak with a language that they do not know. It does not take you over. It does not take over your body. You do not suddenly become a zombie. No, you're talking. But what's coming out of you is not a language you're familiar with. It's something you don't even know. That you are speaking words that you literally do not even understand yourself. And that is the initial physical evidence that God has filled a believer with the Holy Ghost. But on this first sermon, very first sermon, the people who had gathered in Jerusalem heard Peter preach this wonderful message on Jesus Christ, crucified, buried, risen again. And the question was asked, men and brethren, what shall we do? You're telling us that we're sinners. You're telling us that we must turn from unbelief to God and we must believe and that our faith must be centered in Jesus Christ. But what must we do? How do we go about doing this? And Peter's response was, repent and be baptized every one of you. It didn't matter where they came from. It didn't matter what the language was that they spoke, uh, what their native tongue was. It didn't matter what their background was, what the color of their skin was. It didn't matter if they were Jew or Gentile. It didn't matter if they were local or foreign. It didn't matter if they were rich or poor, fat or skinny, ugly or pretty. All they had to do, Peter said, and every one of you repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins so he answered the question who every one of you how in the name of Jesus Christ for what reason for the remission of sins and then Peter said and you shall receive the gift of of the Holy Ghost. For this promise is unto you and to your children and to them that are afar off, meaning foreigners. He said, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So what that did is that took it beyond the realms of geography and it pushed it through the annals of time even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So now the first references were to geography, but the last reference was from now till Jesus comes. This is how it's going to work. Hallelujah. What must you do to be saved? Repent. The first word off of Peter's lips was repent. But we have a man who claims to be a Christian and millions of Christians who claim he is a Christian leader, a godly man, who has said and confessed with his own mouth that he has never felt the need to repent. In his sermon, which he preached, following the healing of the lame man at the gate of the temple, which was called beautiful. Peter admonished his listeners in Acts 3.19, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. In his response to the priests and the religious leaders who had commanded him to stop preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus Christ, Peter once again admonished his listeners with these words in Acts chapter 5 verses 30 and 31. Peter said, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance 
to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Peter rebuked a man by the name of Simon, a sorcerer, a magician as it were, who sought to buy the ability to lay his hands on believers so that they might receive the baptism with the Holy Ghost and speak with other tongues. And this is how Peter responded to this man, Simon. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor what in this matter. For thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. While sharing with the apostles in Jerusalem of his experience at the house of Cornelius a Roman soldier who had sent for Peter at the bidding of an angel and who with his entire family and his entire household experienced an outpouring of the Holy Ghost which I might add was accompanied by speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance Peter speaking to the apostles at Jerusalem said this in Acts 11, 15 through 18. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, as on us at the beginning. Then I remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John, indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? You've got to remember the apostles at Jerusalem, the believers at Jerusalem, they didn't think that Jesus was for the Gentiles. They thought the Messiah was strictly a Jewish thing. Mm -hmm. Now here Peter went and preached in the home of a Roman soldier. These people were occupying Israel. They had colonized the nation of Israel. They were hated. They were despised. And Peter went into the home of a Roman soldier and preached Jesus to them. And guess what happened? They received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. So God proactively demonstrated to Peter and those who were with him that he accepted these people as well. That the message of the gospel applied to the non-Jew, otherwise known as the Gentile, as well as the Jew. Peter said, what was I that I could withstand God? He said, look what God did. What am I going to do? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Repentance is at the heart of the Christian gospel. Repentance is often neglected in the church world today, but it is an essential truth. Hallelujah. The Apostle Paul preached these words at the altar of the unknown God in Athens, saying, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day in which, in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. That's found in Acts 17, 30 through 31. Paul said, 
There's a day of judgment coming. Our primary text today in 2 Peter said there is a day of judgment coming. The only way to escape this day of judgment, we must begin with repentance. Yes. There is no access to the kingdom of God without repentance. One cannot be born again according to the word of God without repentance. Paul preached to believers in Asia saying this, And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. The most important part of the gospel message is repentance. That is why it is an essential truth. It is not a secondary truth. It is not a truth that you can talk about if you feel up to it and ignore if you feel up to it. No, it is essential. It is oft neglected, but it is essential. And I'm here to tell you today, believer and saint of God, and those who are listening to me today who have never been born again, you will not stand before God on judgment day and Blame me if you are lost because I've told you the way. I have told you what God asks of you. I have told you there is no access to the kingdom of God without first repentance. That's where this whole thing starts. That's why you read the apostles referring to repentance so often. Why? Is that all there is? No, but that's where you start. If that's where you start, you certainly can't get beyond that until you've, you've gone there first. Am I telling the truth? Amen. Speaking before King Agrippa, after being arrested by the Jewish leaders and sent to prison for preaching Jesus Christ, while sharing his personal testimony of his own miraculous conversion on the road to Damascus, the Apostle Paul once again said to King Agrippa in Acts 26, 19 and 20, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus, and at Jerusalem, and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works, meaning actions, meet for repentance or to do actions which demonstrate repentance. Repentance, my friend, is a change of heart. I have gone through the entire book of Acts and I've shared with you a number of occasions where the apostles were preaching and you are teaching and you will notice that at every occasion they always, always, always admonish their hearer to repent. The book of Acts is the only historical book that we find in the New Testament that literally outlines the history of the church. It's the only book. There's only one book in the entire Bible that literally tells you exactly what the apostles taught, exactly what the apostles said, exactly what the apostles preached, exactly what the apostles and the early church of the first century, what they experienced. Only the book of Acts gives us this record. I've walked you through that record 
and over and over and over and over again you have seen that at the heart of their message was repentance. Well, if repentance is so important, then is it not important today for us to understand what repentance is? Repentance is a change of heart, which results in a change in our actions. When we repent, we ask God to forgive us, but we do not then purpose in our heart to continue doing things as we've always done them. No, if you genuinely repent, then you're asking God to forgive you for past violations so that you may now attempt anyway to proceed without doing that again. If you ask a policeman who stops you for speeding, I'm sorry, officer. I really am sorry. I can't afford a ticket right now. Please forgive me. And that officer says, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll let you go by with a warning this time. And then he gets into his car and you proceed to put your car into drive and hit the gas and take off at 90 miles an hour and you tear down the road the same speed you were going to begin with, you better believe you're going to get pulled over all over again. And this time, he may not even write you a ticket. He may just drag you off to jail. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. This is how many people come to God. They foolishly think that I can play games with God. I can say, oh Lord, forgive me, and then turn around and just do things the same old way. Now listen, there are times when we ask God sincerely for forgiveness, and we somehow or another fall back into old habits. That happens. I'm, don't anybody misunderstand me. That happens. But there's a difference between purposing in your heart, I'm going to do differently, and then striving to do differently, and not purposing in your heart to do differently, but just saying, forgive me, so you can get off the hook. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? Too many people believe that they can ask God for forgiveness simply so God will let them off the hook, and they have not purposed in their heart to discontinue the actions which can be, if you're an unbeliever, if you're not saved today, you say, well, what do I have to repent of? It's not about whether you're a good person or a bad person. It's not about whether you've done bad things or you haven't done bad things. The problem is we are born in a state of sin. What does that mean? That means that our grandparents brought this disease into our bloodline. And when you are born, you inherit that disease, sin, period. End of the story. It is there. Whether you're a good person or a bad person, whether you've done evil things or not, that is not uh, consequential here. The truth is we are born in sin. We are, we are born in the same state that Adam and Eve brought us into through their unbelief and their lack of obedience. And for that reason, whether we're good or bad, whether we're evil or good, we must repent. What does that mean? That means we must turn to God. We must turn to God and say, okay, Lord, up until now I have lived my life without faith. Up until now I have lived my life as though you did not exist. Up until now I lived my life as though that uh, human beings were not one day going to answer for the deeds that were done in the flesh. But I now believe because of Jesus. I believe, God, you're real. I believe you sent the Messiah to die on the cross for my sins. And I believe, God, that you'll forgive me for his sake. And I turn from my unbelief and I turn instead to belief. Now, if you turn to believe, what's the next step? Well, the next step is you're going to act like you believe. This is why God himself, God himself married repentance with baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we experience a change of heart concerning the existence of God and our need to embrace and live a life of faith and to walk in relationship with him, it is imperative that our faith now, our faith is the agency whereby we're even able to repent. But it is imperative 
that our faith then be followed or demonstrated by action. The way new converts demonstrate they have genuinely repented, they've turned from sin and unbelief to faith and obedience to the Word of God is through water baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is your faith being put into action. See, God don't just take you at your word. You know, there's an old saying, talk is cheap. There's a lot of preachers out there who will tell you, oh, to be saved, all you have to do is pray this prayer and hallelujah, you're saved. Got news for you, children. That is not scriptural. That is not biblical. That is not what the apostles of Jesus Christ taught mm -hmm. or practiced or believed. Mm -hmm. Every convert in the New Testament, every convert in the book of Acts, the history of the early church, who repented of their sins were immediately, as quickly as they could be, baptized in water in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you look at Peter and John coming out of the, excuse me, Paul and Silas coming out of prison, the Bible said it was after the midnight hour that they came out of that old prison. The Spirit of God having shaken the ground caused an earthquake which caused the doors of the prison to sling open and the chains that they were bound by to fall off of them. And the centurion who was guarding them was so fearful for his life that he was ready to fall upon his own sword because he knew, he knew that his superiors would have him killed if those men escaped. And Paul and Silas said, do yourself no harm <laughs> and don't hurt yourself. Let me tell you what just happened. God is stepping in on our behalf. Hallelujah. And the word of God said that centurion took Paul and Silas to his house. He tended to their wounds because they had been beaten on their backs with whips. He tended to their wounds. He listened to their message. Those people believed the gospel that Paul preached and at, we don't know what hour, 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because the New Testament message of the Gospel marries baptism in Jesus' name with repentance. You don't do one without the other. What if I can't do baptism in Jesus' name immediately? Can I turn to God in repentance and ask Him to forgive me? Yes, absolutely. But then what you do is you try to find if you can be baptized as soon as you're able. Do you follow me? Amen. We live in a different world than they did. Things work a little bit differently. You can find a church. If you need help, contact me. I'll put you in touch with a church that will happily baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the way new converts demonstrate they have genuinely repented, turning from sin and unbelief, is through baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God may respond to our genuine repentance, our change of heart, by filling us with the Holy Ghost even before we've acted upon our repentance and been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, as he did the house of Cornelius. See, the people at Cornelius' house, while Peter was still preaching, the Holy Ghost fell on them, which hurt him. But continue to read the story, and you will find that immediately afterwards, the Word of God said that Peter commanded them to be baptized. How? In the name of the Lord. You may get the Holy Ghost immediately, but you still want to be obedient to the Word of God and be baptized in the name of the Lord. God's filling us with the Holy Ghost is His response to our faith and repentance. Only God can know the heart of man. Only God can see and know when an individual has genuinely believed and experienced a change of heart, repenting, turning their back on 
the life of sin and unbelief. The believer is initiated into the body of Christ and the family of God through water baptism in Jesus' name. If you remember Paul standing before Agrippa, he said to King Agrippa, he said, uh, uh, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God. But he didn't stop there. He said, and do works actions meet for repentance demonstrating repentance that is exactly what baptism in Jesus name is in James chapter 2 verses 18 through 24 James the brother of Jesus who kept company with the apostles and the early church James writes yea a man may say Thou hast faith, and I have works, meaning I have actions. James said, Show me thy faith without thy works, without your actions, and I will show thee my faith by my works. So James says, Can you demonstrate to me you have faith without actions that prove you have faith? He said, Because i got news for you. I can show you I've got faith by reason of my actions. That's exactly what James just said in James chapter 2 and verse 18. Verse 19, Thou believest that there is one God? Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. I mean, there ain't no big thing about believing in God. Just because somebody says they believe in God, that is not something to jump up and shout about. Even the devils know that there is a God. That's right. Verse 20, but wilt thou know, O vain man, that without works, that faith without works is dead. Faith without action is dead. This is why repentance and baptism in Jesus' name are married one to another. Faith with action. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? by action when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was made perfect. So James said it was Abraham's actions that demonstrated and made perfect Abraham's faith. Mm -hmm. If Abraham had claimed to believe God but didn't do what God had asked him to do, which is what water baptism in Jesus' name is, God, what God asked us to do. He said if he had done that, then his works would have, his faith would have been empty. He said in verse 23, and the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God ye see then verse 24 James 2 ye see then how that by works actions a man is justified listen to this phrase because it blows fundamentalist evangelical theology right out of the water verse 24 Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Fundamentalists and evangelicals try to tell you, oh, we believe in justification through faith alone, then you're an idiot. Can I say it any plainer than that? then you're an idiot because the Word of God tells us as plainly as it can possibly tell us that our faith alone without action is dead. Mm -hmm. And, the, and uh, James, the brother of Jesus, said, Ye see then how that works, by works a man is justified. 
Oh, he didn't say by faith a man is justified. He said by works, by actions, a man is justified. And not by faith alone. So when you say we believe in justification by faith alone, when you're contradicting the word of God, you couldn't contradict it any more clearly and any more perfectly than that. Because there is a specific passage of scripture that completely contradicts that statement in its entirety. There are many today in our community who need to be reminded and admonished to repent and to turn to God in faith. We cannot rewrite the message of salvation to accommodate our circumstance. Just because the church has wrongly condemned and mistreated LGBT people, causing them great hurt and sorrow, this does not mean that the message of Christ has changed. Much of what the church has long preached, my friend, is today true and accurate. We must embrace and obey that which is right and discard and correct that which is inaccurate. But to suggest that there is no need of repentance simply because many in the church have misunderstood and misrepresented scripture in abusing and condemning LGBT people is a massive mistake with eternal repercussions. And no one will stand before God in the judgment, no one, no one, no one, and accuse this preacher of not having told them that repentance is a neglected essential truth. No one is going to stand before God in the judgment and fly that accusation at me. Because today, on the 18th of July, 2021, I told you, you must repent. Regardless today of whether you're straight, gay, old, young, black, white, fat, skinny, you cannot and will not be born again and enter into the family of our God without repentance. And I cannot end my message today without reminding the church believers of our need also to repent. Repentance is not a one-time transaction. At every point in our Christian walk, when we come to the realization that we have wronged one another, or we have offended the Lord, if our faith is real and our walk with God is genuine, we must find a place of repentance. Mm -hmm. In 2 Corinthians 7, 8 through 10, Paul wrote to the church, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. He said, I wrote you a letter and you all didn't much like it. He said, but I'm not sorry for that. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. He said, yeah, that epistle might have made you sorry, but just for a little while. Verse 9, Now I rejoice... Not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. So he said, even though you didn't much care for my letter, thank God that letter inspired you to repent. Yes. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. I don't have a lot of time if I'm going to stay within my, my time frame today, so I'm going to talk real plain. Many in the church today are in need of repenting. They need to repent of such foolishness as failing to put God first in their lives. Failing to be in the house of God and assembling with God's people. Failing to act in faith and obedience through tithing. Failing to conduct themselves as believers and as children of God. Offending or acting in an ungodly, unbiblical manner toward one another as children of God. 
The world is in trouble as judgment day is coming. All men everywhere are in need today of repenting of their sin and turning by faith to Jesus Christ. But the church today is equally as much in peril of God's wrath. As we approach the day of judgment with a litany of sins and offenses behind us. While our soul may yet be saved, we will lose our reward and we will be held accountable for our misdeeds. It is impossible to become a child of God and to live as a born again child of God without repentance. The Lord Jesus Christ himself utters these words to those in the church. In the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, the word of God said, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, in other words, redo. Do things the way you used to do things. You left your first love. You're not treating your husband like you treated him when you all first fell in love, when you first got married. What do you have to do? You need to go back. Your husband doesn't treat you like he did when you all first got married. He needs to go back. What did he do back then that he's not doing now? Whatever it is, he needs to redo those things. Hello now. That's how you go back to your first love. Same thing with God. What did you do when you first came to the Lord? You are happy to go to church. You are happy to tithe. You are happy to be around God's people. Go back to your first love. Go back to your first works. And do the first works, the Lord said, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Lastly, I'm going to end this message today with the words of our Lord found in Revelation chapter 3, verse 19. The Lord Jesus Christ declared, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Repentance, my friend, today is an oft-neglected essential truth. Believer and non-believer, we need to repent. When we're in the wrong, when we're in sin, when we disobey God, we need to repent. Hallelujah. Would you stand up with me today?